The musician Prince Rogers Nelson tragically died after an accidental overdose of fentanyl on April 21, 2016. In Prince's final 12 months, he started a memoir, advocated for the Black Lives Matter movement, signed with title, and embarked on his intimate, improvised piano and a microphone tour. Often referred to as a workaholic, Prince was a highly passionate musician who was committed to his craft. In his final year, he was extremely active in the music circuit and was determined to push his limits. According to a piece published in American Music Review, relieved from the financial pressures of a younger artist, Prince was able to spend time making the kind of music he wanted. That said, Prince did want to stay in the contemporary music scene and chose, uncharacteristically, to collaborate with producer Joshua Welton for his 2015 album, Hit and Run Phase One. Up until his tragic death in 2016, Prince was as active as ever, remaining socially engaged while making vibrant music and doing a solo tour. Prince's music was as politically charged as ever in 2015, after the highly publicized tragic death of Freddie Gray came to light in April 2015, Prince spoke up by doing what he knew best, writing music. His song, Baltimore, was a tribute to the moment. In May 2015, Prince performed the song in Baltimore at the Rally for Peace concert. The song's official music video had photos from Black Lives Matter rallies and news reports on Freddie Gray, coupled with footage from his Baltimore show. So eventually, with courageous people going out there and actually saying something and standing up for it, I think we'll get some balance. Prince avoided prominently featuring himself in the video, allowing the powerful visuals to do the talking. According to former special advisor for Green Jobs, Van Jones, who worked with Prince, the singer didn't care about boosting his personal brand while making music about social issues. He was more concerned about lending his voice to the cause Prince told Jones, everything that you want to do that you think will help the black community, I will help you do it. This is how Jones ended up being a part of Prince's staff. Prince worked with community groups extensively and peppered in live events. In an unexpected move, Prince chose to remove himself from music streaming platforms such as Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Music in 2015. He only spared title and was hit with lawsuits from streaming platforms for choosing to step away. Prince was making a big statement with this decision by choosing to make access to his music harder after giving Tidal subscribers exclusive access. What made Tidal seem different in Prince's mind was the fact that it was owned by musician Jay-Z, who exercised a degree of control over his master recordings that Prince had fought for over the decades. Prince had expressed his distrust of online services in 2010, telling The Telegraph, I don't see why I should give my new music to iTunes or anyone else. They won't pay me in advance for it, and then they get angry when they can't get it. Spotify did respond to Prince's decision to walk away from the company and issued a statement that read, We have cooperated with the request and hope to bring his music back as soon as possible. Prince had his reasons for the move, such as promoting black ownership, representation in the music industry, and encouraging artists to take control. He also had more flexibility with Tidal that offered an on-demand delivery setup for Prince's music. The thing with Prince was that, to the public eye, he avoided vices, including marijuana and alcohol. The singer had a solid reputation. What nobody knew at that time was that the singer was, in fact, struggling with addiction and coping with pain. According to the New York Times, Prince was known for being extremely secretive about his life, which could explain why his close aides weren't aware of his struggle with addiction. One of Prince's tour managers, Alan Leeds, revealed that the singer suffered in private after years of stunt-filled performances. As Leeds revealed, he was that kind of old-school, the-show-must-go-on guy, so the idea of him medicating himself in order to perform isn't strange to me. There was speculation about Prince's drug use and dependency on painkillers after his death, while many were unsure when Prince started relying on opioids, his half-brother mentioned per Rolling Stone that the singer had regularly consumed cocaine and Percocet in the 2000s. Others, like Prince's old friend singer Mavis Staples, suggested that Prince had been suffering from unbearable hip pain for a very long time. As Staples revealed, someone said he needs hip replacement surgery, but he won't have it, and he's in pain all the time. Prince had major plans for himself, such as writing a memoir to share his major life experiences. The singer had even signed a book contract to pen his memoir. The book's working title was The Beautiful Ones, and it was scheduled to be released in 2017. Unfortunately, the singer passed away before that could come to pass. 
However, Prince's collaborator on the project, Dan Pipenbring, did finish the book. When asked whether Prince would have liked the quasi-autobiography that Pipenbring completed with the help of notes and early writings from the singer, Pipenbring said, I am always really reluctant to say for certain about what he would think about anything. I have to imagine he would be pleased with the book. Prince's final tour, Piano and a Microphone, took the world by storm in February 2016. These were powerful performances that were far more intimate than any of his previous shows. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the future now. Prince chose to go on stage with just his piano and sang to his heart's content, drawing the crowd in with his magnetic voice. Prince's Melbourne performance received highly positive reviews. For the Sydney Morning Herald, Martin Bolton wrote, the ecstatic Melbourne crowd could barely believe their good fortune. This was the type of show only previously witnessed recently at Paisley Park, his home in Minneapolis. The tour's description read, For those blessed enough to attend, everything about these exclusive performances has been carefully considered to deliver special once-in-a-lifetime experiences. Those who were in attendance were treated to rare interpretations of Prince's most popular songs, coupled with b-sides that had hardly ever been witnessed live in the past. After finishing a series of these performances, Prince was on his private plane on the way back home when something unprecedented happened on April 15, 2016. The singer had overdosed and his life was in danger. The plane that was heading to Minneapolis asked for permission to initiate an emergency landing, stating that the passenger on board had collapsed and wasn't responding. As soon as the flight landed, one of Prince's bodyguards quickly carried him as emergency attendants got to work and administered a shot of Narcan to the unconscious star. The shot given to the singer blocked the opiates he'd taken and made him experience withdrawal symptoms. Prince was taken to a nearby hospital, but the visit didn't last long. Prince was said to have boarded a flight to Minneapolis just 10 hours after being hospitalized. A story by the New York Times revealed that he had possibly overdosed on Percocet, something he could have taken to combat pain. The incident terrified some of his friends who inquired about his well-being. He told his close aides that he was doing fine and there was nothing to be alarmed about. Prince staunchly maintained a spotless public persona. As a Jehovah's Witness, Prince didn't even touch alcohol or meat and wasn't publicly associated with drug use. After his death, Prince's lawyer, L. Londell McMillan, who had managed the artist in the past and had known him for many years, spoke out against accusations that Prince had a drug problem, stating, Everybody who knows Prince knows he wasn't walking around drugged up. That's foolish. However, it was undeniable that something had been amiss. Speculation surrounded the star's addiction to pills and other substances. McMillan shot back that the singer was health conscious and a staunch vegan. McMillan added that he had a word with the musician in April and he was in good spirits. However, it was ultimately revealed that Prince's team had, in fact, asked the specialist doctor, Dr. Howard Kornfeld, for support mere days before his passing. Kornfeld was known to have helped his patients battle addiction to painkillers. After his mid-flight scare, Prince didn't take very long to get back on his feet. The singer, in fact, wrote on Twitter to comfort his fans and put them at ease with a simple note that said he was, quote, transformed. His spokespeople also issued statements, saying that Prince had simply experienced a bad bout of flu. According to The Guardian, the singer was pretty active in the next few days. He wandered around his city and spent time at a record store called Electric Fetus as an act of solidarity for Record Store Day. Bob Fuchs, who was in charge of the store, said later, He was dressed really nice. I wouldn't have guessed anything was wrong. Prince purchased several albums in a few minutes before leaving. He also rode a bicycle later that day near his estate. A local resident spotted him and took photos of the star. She posted them on a social platform and her friends asked about his health. She responded with, quote, well, clearly he was feeling better. Intriguingly, Prince also decided to organize a grand party at his residence on the evening of April 16, 2016. There were over 300 attendees present. A photographer who was a part of the event later expressed his surprise, saying, it was pretty surprising, pretty crazy, because he had just been hospitalized a day prior. Prince performed for his guests and also spoke about his health, telling them, Save your prayers for a couple of days. You know, I felt like Jack Johnson then too. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't going to be put down. After Prince died, reports revealed that the singer had visited a doctor shortly before he passed away. He had his bodyguard and friend along for the visit. The bodyguard had asked Dr. Michael T. Schellenberg 
for advice before the trio made the trip. According to ABC News, he wrote in the message, Prince is asking for fluids. Can you call me? The doctor wrote back in the morning. His message read, I have records and test results. I can drive over if it would help. Better for privacy. Tragically, hours later on April 21st, 2016, Prince was found unresponsive in an elevator at Paisley Park. The place was chaotic when Prince's doctor reached his estate and was met by emergency officials and cops at the scene. Several bottles of pills were recovered from the house. Emergency officials tried but failed to revive Prince, who had accidentally overdosed on counterfeit Vicodin laced with fentanyl. Michael Holtz, a DJ who had often performed at Prince's residence, spoke about his grief, saying, I just felt like Prince was just going to live well into his 80s and beyond. Prince didn't have a will when he died. His death was followed by a long and nasty battle over his plush estate. As many as 15 lawyers got involved at the start of the trial. According to Vulture, Prince's sister, his half-siblings, and other would-be heirs were looking for a piece of the estate. Prince had no children or a spouse at the time of his death, so it was tricky to gauge who should inherit the musician's vast wealth. Randy Phillips, Prince's former manager, found it easy to believe that Prince had not bothered making a will or naming heirs, saying, Trust me, there is not going to be one, a will. He never thought about dying, and he would never sign a contract. He thought it was slavery. It was undeniable, however, that the star had left behind considerable assets, with an estimated value of over $300 million. Before his life was tragically cut short, Prince had bought several properties and owned the master tapes of several of his peerless classic albums. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.